Hi class, welcome to my pre-calculus uh, video lecture library. So we are starting with chapter 1.1, real numbers. This video <clears throat> lecture series follows the pre-calculus by Stuart. Um, I'm using the seventh edition. Uh, I, I use this for my classes, so um, you can use this to self-study or you can use it for your classes if you're an instructor as well. Um, just a quick heads up, chapter one is basically a review of algebra one and algebra two. So all the things that we're going to cover in chapter one are is review material. However, um, I am going to go pretty deep into the material, uh, deeper than I generally would in an algebra one or algebra two course, right? So you're going to see some new notations, um, possibly some new ways to think about things. I'm going to use some pretty difficult examples because I'm assuming you already know algebra. Um, that's not to say that all of the examples are hard. Obviously, I will have some easy and some medium level ones, but I try to throw uh, some new stuff into the mix because, again, I'm assuming that you've took in algebra at some point. Um, when you watch these video series, I highly, highly highly suggest that you watch this with a pencil and a piece of paper. You should definitely be taking notes as I am going through my video lectures. Um, now these lectures are available as PDF and as a course reader. Once I finish the an entire chapter, I add to my course reader. So these notes are available, but you should definitely be taking your own notes as well and working through the problems with me. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started on chapter 1.1. So we're going to discuss the real numbers. So the real numbers are composed of several different number sets. Okay. The first of those <clears throat> being the natural numbers. Okay. The natural numbers is notated by this fancy looking N here, right? And it has numbers like one, two, three, so forth and so forth, right? So dot, dot, dot means keep going in this fashion, right? So these are whole numbers. Notice that there are no negatives and zero is not included, right? So the natural numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yada, 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 forever and forever. Okay. So these are commonly referred to as the counting numbers, right? They're the numbers that you learn as a child when you learn how to count. Okay. So these natural numbers are a subset of a larger set of numbers, which are the integers. The integers are notated with this fancy Z, and it is the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, forever and forever, including 0, and the opposite of the uh, natural numbers, which is the negative natural numbers, which is not a thing, I just made that up. So they're the negative values of the natural numbers. Okay, so we go in the negative direction as well forever and forever. So generally you learn your counting numbers, right? Your natural numbers or your whole numbers. And then you learn about the negatives of those. Okay. And so that's the way that this goes. The natural numbers is a subset of the integers. The integers, which contains the natural numbers, is a subset of the rationals. Okay. The rationals are notated by the fancy Q symbol here. They are basically your fractions. Okay. Whenever you have an integer over another integer, whether one of them is positive or negative, both positive, both negative, it doesn't really matter, but you have some number over another number, those numbers being integers, we can talk about the rationals either in their fraction form, which is an exact form, or we can start to talk about their approximate forms. So their decimal forms either terminate Right, so you see here, this does not keep going on forever and forever. It stops somewhere. That would be a rational number. I could write this number as a fraction, okay? Or their decimal form repeats, right? So you can see this is two three two three two three two three two three, and it'll continue to be two three two three, right? Um, so the rationals uh, are either fractions or their decimal forms terminate, or their decimal forms repeat themselves, okay? Uh, apologies, it looks like this is a, a comma that should just be the dot, dot, dot form. So I'll fix that in my PDF. The last part 
of our number system that we're going to talk about for now is the irrational numbers. We call this R, which stands for real numbers. The real numbers is the rationals and the irrationals together. Okay. So the irrationals, the notation is all of our regular numbers, the real numbers, backslash Q. Now this backslash means take out the rationals. So the irrationals are basically all of the real numbers that's left over after we look at the rationals. Okay, so the rationals plus all the irrationals together give us the real numbers. Now irrational numbers are numbers that have no um, fractional form and they their decimal form either it does not repeat okay and it does not terminate it does not stop right so that's the irrational numbers so these are a couple examples of each of these um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth here <laughs> so again our natural numbers which we notate with n are the counting numbers okay also called the whole numbers so depending on who you talk to what textbook you're using sometimes they say zero is included in the natural numbers sometimes they say zero is not included in the counting numbers so for here you could include zero here you could not include zero here it really just depends on who you're talking to and their perspective okay um the integers right again is notated by z these are the set of positive and negative whole numbers, and they include zero. Okay. So when you see a little plus on the uh, top part of one of these notations, not including the n, but on the z notation, this means we're talking about the integers, but only the positive integers. Okay. Z plus is equal to n because if we go back here, look at what n is n is integers but it's only the positives it doesn't include the negatives and I guess you could say that includes zero again depending on what number system so if we look at the integers and only the positive ones that's the natural numbers right if we look at Z and only the negative ones well we can notate that with Z minus okay it's only the negative integers so I will use a notation not Z plus because I could just use n when I'm talking about that but I will say R plus, okay? Because remember, we're talking about real numbers, but maybe we're only talking about positive real numbers. That happens quite often. So I will talk about R with the plus symbol on top. Or maybe I'm only talking about negative numbers. So I'll talk about R and I'll put the negative uh, sign on top, okay? So make sure you're wary of that now that you understand what I'm saying when I put R plus or R negative again that goes in the exponent position it does not say R plus right next to it or R negative that means something completely different okay so Z plus the plus is like an exponent um, or Z negative the Z negative is like an exponent okay here zero is neither positive nor negative so when we talk about Z plus or Z negative or R plus or R negative we're not including zero Okay, zero is not positive or negative, but zero is even. Zero is an even number. Okay, so it's even, but it is not positive or negative. So the rational numbers are the set of numbers that can be represented as a fraction. So again, one number on top of the other. So some number is represented as one number on top of the other. So here M could be the decimal form or if this is like 5 over 1 this will be 5 right um, the only restriction here is that this bottom value cannot be 0 a and B can be any integer right remember I said it has to be an integer an integer on top that means it could be positive on top negative on top positive or negative on bottom right so if this is po negative on top and negative on bottom you get a positive value out right so it can be an integer positive or negative it doesn't matter the only restriction is that B cannot be uh, zero no zeros on the bottom and no irrational numbers okay you cannot put an irrational number here so you can't have like pi over four um, that would not be rational that would still be real 
but it would not be a rational number, it would not be a fraction, okay? In the strict definition of a fraction. Um, here, this symbol means is an element of. So A and B are integers. I will use this fancy looking E notation everywhere, okay? So again, I'm gonna be introducing you guys to more higher level math notation. Um, just so that you're more familiar with it when you come across it, but I will always explain what it means, okay? So here, A and B are integers. They're in the set of integers. They have to be an integer. That's what this uh, little E, it's more like an epsilon, means, okay? A rational number in decimal form, again, it, it either repeats forever or it terminates, okay? So let's look at an example. An example of a repeating decimal is one third, one over three. When we put this into its decimal form, it's just 0 0.33333333333 forever. It never stops. Okay. And so when we have a repeating decimal, a lot of times we only write the repeating part and then we just put a line over it. Right. So since the three repeats forever and ever and ever, a lot of times we just write 0 0.3 with a line. So that signifies to the reader that this three continues forever, okay? A terminating decimal is one that stops, right? So for example, one half in decimal form is just 0 0.5. There's nothing else after it. The stuff that comes after it is all zeros, right? So we don't have to write the zeros because it's unnecessary information. It stops somewhere, right? So both of these are fractions, right? They're rational numbers, right? An integer over an integer. And they have either a repeating decimal form or a terminating decimal form. The irrational numbers, again, is the set of numbers whose decimal forms do not repeat, nor do they terminate, right? So the, the most common one that you hear about is always pi, right? Pi does not repeat, and pi does not stop. It goes on forever. So pi is an irrational number. Um, so is... This number, the the number E, it's 2.714 something something to that effect. A lot of square roots, their decimal forms never repeat and never stop. Okay, this is a fancy exponent um, number, which is actually a root. It's the same thing. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> the rational numbers. And the irrational numbers together make up our number system that we deal with the most, which is the real numbers. Again, the real numbers is R, okay? So between any two numbers, any two numbers, there is an infinite number of rational numbers, okay? There's an infinite number of fractions, right? Or you can think about it as a number, an infinite number of decimals that either go on forever or terminate, okay? So an example, between the value zero and 0 0.00001, there's an infinite amount of rationals, right? So the easiest way to construct this is to use the decimal forms because we are already given the decimal forms. I chose zero and a number that is very, very, very small, right? So this is what tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths, hundred thousandths. This is between one, zero and one one hundred thousandth, a very, very, very small number. So the numbers between this and 0 0.0001 are, okay, 0 0.000001, I just added one extra zero, okay? So it's smaller than this number, but it's larger than zero. So this is one um, ten hundred thousandths, okay? Hundred ten or one millionth, I guess, would be the correct way to say that. So this is one one millionth, right? This is one one hundred thousandth. So this is smaller than this number and larger than zero, okay? So another number that is um, in between this number and this number would be two millionths, right? And then three millionths, and then four millionths, and I can always keep going until I get very, very close to this number and then I can just add some more numbers. I can keep adding numbers after the two, right? I could go 0 0.00001, one. The same thing again, one, two, 
one, three, one, four, one. I can keep counting like that. I can keep adding numbers after. I can keep putting zeros in front and make this even smaller and it'll be closer to zero, but less than this number. So there's an infinite number of numbers between zero and this one one hundredth. Okay. Hundred thousand. I'm sorry. So we can always add as many zeros as we want in front of just behind the uh, decimal point um, that will make the numbers even smaller but still larger than zero I can always add numbers at the end behind the one or the two or the three or what have you and make it even smaller and it'll still be behind this right so an example is here me adding more zeros in front okay and even more zeros in front I can add as many zeros as I want I can hold down the zero button on my uh, computer or my calculator and just keep on adding zeros and then put a one at the end and I will be larger than zero and less than this how many zeros can I add an infinite okay there's a there's all kinds of possibilities there's an infinite number of values in between these two very small numbers here okay so now even though there's an infinite number of of rational numbers between any two numbers that I want to pick out okay there's also an infinite number of irrational numbers between any two numbers right in fact there's more irrational numbers in between these two numbers than there are rational numbers between these two numbers right so there's an infinite number of rationals between here but there's also an infinite number of irrationals but there's more irrationals right so how do you have infinity and infinity but there's more of this infinity than the other infinity right does that make sense it doesn't but that's the way math works okay so there's more irrationals between any two numbers than there are rational numbers decimals between any two numbers okay so what this means is that we say that the irrationals are more dense than the rational numbers okay there's more of them so they're more dense there's still an infinite of both but the irrationals are more dense than the others because there's it's a larger infinity I guess you would say than the others okay so pr pretty interesting fact here about the number system okay so now let's talk about the properties of real numbers so these are things that you've done in algebra over and over again but now we're gonna just Review them, go over them, their properties that we're going to use to make this class work. Okay. okay. So first is the commutative property of addition. Basically, what this means is that if you add any two numbers, you can switch the order that you add them together, and you will get the exact same thing. Okay. Very important property here. The commutative property of multiplication is the exact same thing, but with multiplication, if I multiply two numbers in some order and then switch the order I multiply them they still get me the same number out okay the associative property of addition means that if you have three different numbers that you're trying to add together the order that you decide to add them together in does not matter okay so here if I have a plus B plus C if I add B plus C first and then add a it's the same thing as if I were to have added a plus B first and then add C okay they're still all getting added together it does not change the value of the output. We also have the associated property of multiplication. It's the same thing. If I'm multiplying three numbers together, it doesn't matter which two I decide to multiply first, right? So if I multiply B times C and then multiply that number times A, it'll be the same thing as if I multiplied A times B and then multiply that times C. So again, notice that the parentheses signify what happens first, right? I do the stuff in the parentheses first that gives me a single quantity so it's a plus this quantity it's this quantity plus C right a times this quantity this quantity times C so whenever you see a set of parentheses it's telling you that that is a number okay and that number takes this form right so whatever is going on inside the parentheses that's going to give me a number and then I take that number and then I apply the operation with whatever operation you see on the outside of the parentheses. Okay, very, very important. 
that will kind of take you very, very far in mathematics if you think of a parentheses as a quantity, okay? So your distributive property. If I have this quantity times A, it's the same thing as if I were to multiply and distribute A across the elements inside of that parentheses, okay? I can also do it the other way and have A on the other side, and it will still distribute across my parentheses, okay? We call this a, um, a left side distribution because my number is on the A and it distributes to the left, and then this is called a right side distribution. Um, and again, because of the commutative property, I could write this as BA plus CA, right? It's the same thing. And that would just kind of signify that I distributed from the right and it stayed on the right. But here, um, that's kind of for a higher level of mathematics, that small distingu uh, distinction. Here, it doesn't really matter because we're just talking about little numbers, okay? The additive identity. So the additive identity means that if I add the value of the additive identity, so the additive identity is an actual value, right? It's a, it's a, um, it's an object that we use. So if I have this thing and I add it to something, I come out with the same thing I started with. Okay. So what number can I add to everything and still end up with that same number? Zero, right? Zero is the additive identity. If I add a plus the additive identity zero, it's the same thing as if I take the additive identity and add it to a number, I will always get out that original number, right? That's the identity because it does nothing. It doesn't change anything, um, but it allows me to add stuff in. So a common trick in mathematics is to add zero into things, okay? So a lot of times we'll add in what I like to call a fancy zero. So I might add in a plus b minus b, right? So b minus b is zero, but me adding in b and then subtracting it right away allows me to manipulate whatever system I'm working with so that I can start to do some fancy stuff, okay? So the additive identity is pretty important. We also have a multiplicative identity. So for the additive identity, we take a number and add that additive identity and get the same thing out. So for the multiplicative identity, we're gonna have something and multiply it times that multiplicative identity and get the same thing out. So what do you think that number is? You should know. It is one, right? One times A is always gonna get you A. So one is that multiplicative identity. Okay. We have the additive inverse. The additive inverse is just, um, for the real numbers, it is the negative value of whatever number you are using, right? So A plus its distinct additive inverse, right? So here the additive identity is a single object. The multiplicative identity is a single object. The additive inverse is specific to the value that you're working with already, right? So A has its own additive inverse. Three has its own additive inverse. 10 has its own additive inverse, right? So if we add a value with its additive inverse, we will get the additive identity, okay? And again, because of the commutative property of addition, we can switch the order that we add things together. And again, here we go. So if we take a number and add it to its additive identity, I'm sorry, its additive inverse, we will get out the additive identity, okay? Multiplicative inverse, so same thing. If I take a number and I multiply it by its multiplicative inverse, I will get out the multiplicative identity, right? So if my value is A, its inverse is one over A. If my value is one over A, its multiplicative inverse is A, right? So one over A times A is the same thing as A times one over A. So again, this is from the commutative property of multiplication. It doesn't matter which order I uh, write things, okay? That will give me out a value of one, again, which is the multiplicative identity. So again, just to re recap, zero is the additive identity. Negative A is the uh, additive inverse, okay? When you add a real number and it's additive inverse, negative A, you get out the additive identity zero, okay? One is the multiplicative identity. 
1 over a is the multiplicative inverse. When you multiply a real number with this multiplicative inverse, you get out the multiplicative identity. Okay. So here are some properties of negatives, right? So if you multiply negative 1 times a real number a, you're going to get negative a, right? If you take the negative of a negative, you get back to the positive. Negative a times b is the same as a times negative b, right? So this negative, you can also, you can, you can always think of it as negative 1. So this really is similar to having negative 1 times a times b. So it doesn't matter which order we apply the negative, right? So here I apply it to the a first. Here I apply it to the b first because everything is being multiplied, right? So that's the associative property of multiplication. So in the end, we'll get negative a times b. Okay. Um, again, if we have two negatives, then the two negatives turn into a positive, and we just multiply the a and the b terms together. Right? Here again, this is like a negative 1 outside of a quantity of a and b, so the negative gets to be distributed across this quantity. Right? That's from the distribution property. So that gives us a negative a and a negative b. Um, again, this is not negative a times negative b like we had here. This is negative a minus a positive b. Right? So it's just changing the signs across our quantity here. Negative um, a minus b, same thing. The negative distributes across this quantity. And we get a negative a plus b. And we can shorten and combine um, properties 5 and 6, right? So this last thing that we have here is that we can always switch the order from the commutative property of addition. We can switch which order we move things. But if we do that, the signs have to stick with the value, right? So here B is positive. It goes in front. It's still positive, right? A is negative. So when it switches signs, the negative stays attached to the A. And this turns into B minus A. So again, these last two terms here can be combined and written as negative times a plus or minus b, right? So since the property is the same that's happening here, the only thing that's changing is the sign in the middle. Notice that what happens here. The sign in front stays the same, but the sign here changes. So here we have plus minus, plus minus. That will give us a negative. A is still negative, but instead of this being plus minus like it was, the, swap, the signs switch. It turns into a negative and a plus. So when we multiply a plus minus sign by negative, it switches orientation and it turns into a negative plus. Okay. So where it was positive, it would now be negative. Where it was negative, it is now positive. Okay. So this is some notation that I'm going to utilize in this class as, as well. So when you see a plus minus and then all of a sudden you see a negative plus, that means it was multiplied by a negative somewhere, um, and the signs had to switch. Okay, so here you get negative a minus b, and then the negative a plus b going on. So now let's talk about properties of fractions. Okay, so it tends to be that in an algebra class, trig, precal, calculus, diffie cube, pretty much all the way up, everyone hates fractions. I used to hate fractions a lot. Um, and so I practiced them a lot until I became really good at them. And now I love fractions. They're, they're easy to use once you know how to work with them. So if we have two fractions and we multiply them together, uh, it's very straightforward. We just multiply the tops together and we multiply the denominators. So again, the tops are called numerators. The bottoms are the denominators. So when we multiply, it's just straight across. There's nothing fancy we have to do. It's just the two top integers times the two bottom integers, right? If we are dividing fractions, typically what we do is we divide, we switch the second fraction, the one that we are um, using to divide the first number, and we multiply by the reciprocal, okay? So the reciprocal means that we swap these ones out. Instead of C over D, it turns into D over C and we multiply. So since multiplication is really easy, right? We're just multiplying the numerators, multiplying the denominators. We turn this into a multiplication problem. And really what we're doing is we're using that uh, multiplicative inverse uh, property 
of the real numbers, right? So we can just write this as a reciprocal and multiply them across. So A over D times B over C. When we are adding two fractions, if they have the same denominator, we can just add the numerators and place them over that common denominator, okay? Um, I will be making an algebra video series later on. Um, I'm kind of going backwards. I started with linear algebra and differential equations, then I started working my way down the mathematics chain instead of up. Um, but at some point, I will make a whole video on possibly just only on fractions, right? Not even part of a series, just because I find that everyone tends to dislike fractions. So I think maybe I'll make some, some, um, <clears throat> a video that talks about fractions only. Okay. Um, but regardless, if they have the common denominator, that means that you're talking about A pieces of C, B pieces of C. You have the same, um, counting principle going on. So you can just talk about how many things you have that are of the same size, basically. Right here, if we have denominators that are different values, we need to make a common denominator, right? So the easiest way to do that is to multiply this pi times d and this one times b, and then we have um, ad over bd plus bc over bd. So you have a common denominator, right? And notice that what happens to the top is what we multiplied on the denominator to make it a common denominator is what we multiplied on the top as well, right? So if you look at this, I still have a, b, but I have d over d, right? Here I still have c over d, but next to it I have b over b. So if you don't remember, whenever you have one value over another value that is the same in the rational world, it's just the one. So I'm really multiplying a over b times one. And I'm multiplying C over D times 1. If you remember what we talked about, 1 is the multiplicative identity here, right? 1 times any number is just A. So I'm not changing the value by multiplying this first term by D over D. And I'm not changing the value of the second term by multiplying by B over B. I'm just changing the way that it looks. And I'm doing that in a purposeful manner so that I have a denominator that works and allows me to utilize this third property of fractions. Okay. So using this third property, B over D or B times D will be my common denominator. And I will just add these two numerators together. Okay. Okay. And for the last part, uh, this coincides with what we have with four, right? If I have A over B, times C over C. So there's a common um, factored term in the numerator and the denominator. We know that that is really just a fancy one, right? So we can cancel those out. And again, this is only if it's being multiplied in the top and being multiplied on the bottom, right? If it's the same term, the same factor term, we can cancel that out and simplify it to A over B. Okay. And the last property uh, has to do with an equality already set between fractions or even any two sides of an equation. If I have A over B equal to C over D, this is when you get to use that property that you guys like to um, call cross multiplication. Okay. So I can have A times D is equal to B times C. Really, we want to think about this as what we call clearing the denominators. Um, clearing the denominators is a more uh, grander sort of way of thinking about this than as cross multiplication. Cross multiplication only works in this small sort of aspect. However, clearing the denominators works for any equation that has fractions. Okay, so we'll get into that later on in a couple sections down the road. Okay, next we're going to talk about sets and intervals. So this is another um, thing that students tend to have issues with. I use set and interval notation everywhere okay so it's very important that you pay attention to this section as well and try your best to get familiar with the way that we work with sets in higher level of mathematics so again we're trying to get you guys ready for calculus so that's why we're introducing you guys to um new versions of old things that you've already seen before right so we always have to give a set a name so a set is a collection of objects okay 
we always give those things a name. So for instance, Toyota is a set, okay? Toyota is a set of all cars that are made by the brand Toyota, right? There's SUVs, there's two doors, there's four doors, there's luxury cars, there's electric cars. Toyota makes all these different things. That would be the set name. Okay, now in mathematics, we don't give things fancy names. We generally call it A, B, C, uh, Delta, Gamma, right? We give them Greek names. It's generally a letter, right? So we have two ways to represent a set of numbers. So we have what's called set builder notation. Generally, we start with the name that we're giving our set equals, and then we put parentheses, um, sorry, curly brackets on either end of our set. And in the middle should be a straight line. Okay. Now the straight line is the divisor. The straight line actually has a name. It actually means something. Um, it means such that. Okay. So this is the name of our set. And these are the options that I'm talking about. Generally, we say that these objects are X. Okay. Now the important part here is that maybe I'm only talking about X that are integers. So I would say X in z okay or maybe i'm only talking about negative integers so i would say x in z negative and then this is the rule that we have right so for these negative integers maybe i'm only looking at the ones that are even right or maybe i'm only looking at the ones that are less than negative 20 right so a equals the things i'm talking about such that these things follow this rule Okay, so that's how set builder notation uh, works. So let's look at an example. Here I'm looking at A equals the set, okay, because it's inside of curly brackets, of negative integers, right? X is a negative integer, such that this negative integer is larger than negative 4. Okay, so it has to be strictly larger than negative 4, and it has to be a negative integer. So that is only the values, what, what's larger than negative four? I'll give you guys a second to think about it. So we have negative three, negative two, and negative one. I don't go up to zero. I don't include one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera, because it's only the negative integers. Remember, zero is not positive or negative, and I'm not including the positives. So it's only these three values. It's not all the numbers. In between here like negative one and a half because negative one and a half is not an integer so here a is a set of negative integers that are larger than negative four so that does not include the value negative four because there's no equality here okay so next we'll talk about interval notation okay interval notation I use a lot more than I do set builder notation However, there are benefits of using one over the other. So if I wanted to express this as an interval, I would have to write this as x is inside of the numbers from negative 3 to negative 1, but also a negative number, negative integer, I'm sorry. Okay. If I had left out the specification that this was a negative number, then this interval would include things like negative 2.1234567891010 or I guess not 10 but 9 right um, it would include things like negative one and a half it would include all numbers from negative 3 to negative 1 but since I'm specifying here that x has to be a negative integer or I could have even just said that x is an integer I didn't even need the negatives because my interval is only in the negative side of the number line it would restrict it to negative three, negative two, and negative one, okay? Although this is a bit overkill, we don't generally use interval notation in this way. Um, I'm just giving you an example of how I can express this both ways, right? Or I can say x is in between negative four and zero, not including negative four and zero. That's the difference between a square um, parenthesis and a curved parenthesis. Here again, I'm saying that x is a negative integer. Again, since I'm only on the negative side, I don't actually need to specify that x is negative here because the interval I have is already on the negative side, okay? So 
not all sets that can be represented in set builder can be represented in interval notation. But the opposite is true. Any set that's in interval notation can be represented in set builder notation. Because set builder can do things like specify that I only want evens or I only want odds or I only want every fourth uh, integer from here to here, right? We can do more stuff in set builder. Interval notation just really says I want values from here to here. Okay, so <clears throat> interval notation is simpler, it's easier to read. Okay, here we go. It's easier to read, okay, because again, generally we don't specify what type of numbers we're looking for, it's generally all real numbers, or we specify this somewhere up the line, right, before we talk about the interval. But interval is easier to read. Interval notation is always the smaller number first and the larger number second. It's always smaller and then larger, okay? And we, we do have that down here, okay? So the rule is we put the appropriate bracket. Is it a square bracket or, or a circle bracket? The smallest number that is allowed in my set, sometimes there is no smallest and I have to put negative infinity. Then I put my largest number and sometimes there is no largest number, so I put positive infinity, okay? and then the bracket. So the brackets do not have to match. I can have a closed bracket here, a square bracket, and I can have an open bracket here, a circle bracket. Okay, so the brackets can be mixed, mixed matched. So again, square brackets are closed, it means the endpoint is included. Circle brackets are open brackets, they mean the endpoints, the numbers that are shown are not included in the set. Okay. Um, Whenever you have negative infinity or infinity, it always, 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 always has an open bracket, okay? Infinity means you're going on forever. It's not a number that you can contain. So you cannot put a closed bracket on infinity because that's not a number. It's a idea, right? It's saying that this goes on forever. So it has to be open. So again, the bracket is dictated by whether the number it is next to is actually in your set or not, you do not need the same type of bracket on both sides of your interval notation. Okay, so you can have um, your square brackets, which are closed, means the end value is included. So if your uh, right side, your large number is included, you put a closed bracket on the right side. If it's not included, you put an open bracket. Okay, it's not included. So that's the way that those work. Sometimes we're and how more than one set are related to each other? Okay, so we have uh, two, three, four, five sets. We want to know how they're related. Are there things that are in common? Are there things that are non-common? Um, so a lot of time we're talking about more than one thing. Okay, so <clears throat> we may need to use more than one interval to describe a set of interest. So we tend to use the symbol that's called union it looks like a uh, like a valley okay like a u and we have the symbol intersection which looks like a hill okay so union is the u intersection is the hill this means or this means and okay we use union to describe um, when we're trying to combine two or more sets together so an example, so we have the set, A is the set of integers that are even, okay? So this is the set of even integers. B is the set of real numbers, okay? So B is really just all of N, okay? X such that X is an N. So this is the even integers. So this includes negatives and positives. This includes only positive whole numbers, right? Then A or B, right, A union B, this is the set of things that are in A and also in B, is going to be all of A and also all of B. So we have the even integers, negative 6, negative 4, negative 2, 0, and then we have all of the ends, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, because 2 is also an even integer, 
4 is also an even integer. 1 is not, but 1 is an n. So it's really us just taking this whole set and this whole set and combining all of the elements together. Okay, That is what OR does for us. We use intersection to describe what is the same about two or more sets. So what are the things that are in A that are also in B? Okay. So example, here we're going to use the exact same sets. So we got A is the even uh, integers. B is just the set of natural numbers. Then the intersection of those two are basically the positive even integers because this is all even integers. This is all whole numbers. So I can't have any negatives in here, okay? Because these aren't negative. I can't have zero because this doesn't include zero, right? And I can't include the odds because this does not include the odds. So the things that are in this set and this set also are 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, da, 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 all the way to infinity, okay? Now, if two sets do not have anything in common at all, then we use this circle with a slash through it, okay? That is called the empty set. And it basically signifies that um, the intersection of these two things have nothing in common, right? So on a number line, we tend to use interval notation to describe a set. So what this means is that when we draw on a number line and we specify um, the graphical representation of an interval, Okay, we use the open and close bracket system to specify uh, when something's included in our set and when something's not included in our set, right? So an open node in the middle of an interval will represent a hole in, in our set, a single missing value where that hole is at, right? So here's an example, okay? Here, as you can see, the um, the odd numbers are missing, which is fine. It's not hard to tell where they are. So this is negative 1, and this is 3. Okay. So this interval exists over negative 1 to 3. Negative 1 is included. 3 is not included. And neither is 0. Okay. So my interval has a hole in it. I cannot represent this as a single interval, right? I can't say, oh, this is from negative one uh, with a square bracket to three with an open bracket. It's two separate intervals. There's just one missing value, okay? So in order to write this, I would say that X is in the set from negative one to zero. You see I have an open bracket at zero. What this means is I can get as close to zero as I want from the left side right so i can be negative 0 0.00000000000001 right which is very very close to zero i can get as close to zero as i can from the negative side but i can't actually be zero okay so that's the first interval or x is allowed to be in the interval from 0 to 3 0 still not included and 3 not included either right meaning that i can be as close to zero as I want from the positive side, 0.00000000000001, right? Very, very close to zero, as close as I can without actually being zero. And then I can, any value is included in this all the way up to three, but not including three. So again, as close to three as I can get, but not actually being there. 2.9999999999999 etc right so i can get extremely extremely close to 3 but i can't actually be 3 i can get extremely close to 0 from either side but i'm not allowed to actually have the value of 0 so here's a quick um, cheat list basically of the notation the set builder description and the graph okay so again there will be a PDF write-up of this, so you'll have that for your, your lecture notes. So if you're struggling to write this part all down as we're going through this video, that's fine. You, you can circle back and either download it from the website or if you're in my class, it'll be posted on your, what we're using right now is Canvas. <laughs> it'll be posted on your Canvas page. Okay, so just a quick things to, to look at. So look at here that the notation, 
is open brackets. Here, both of these are strictly less than. For the graph, they're both open. Okay. Here, these are both closed. Here, the description, they are both inclusive. And for the graph, they are both closed. And then these are just mixtures of those two things, right? Closed and open, closed, open, included, not included, right? And then the opposite of that, here for um, infinity, notice that none of the infinities have a closed bracket around them, okay? This infinity, this infinity. So when we have infinity, we're trying to graph that on the number line, it just goes forever in whichever direction. Um, here there should be an arrow on this side, but again, I took this from the textbook. I didn't make this, so I would have put um, arrows on this side to signify that it goes on forever in this direction. Okay. So next we're going to talk about absolute value and distance. Okay, so we're almost done with the video. We're getting close. I know that this is review. That's why it's so long, um, but we're getting close. All right. Absolute value of a real number is its distance from zero. Okay, so whenever we're looking at absolute value, we're always taking um, distance from zero. That's the way you should think about it. Algebraically, distance is always positive. So absolute value is always positive, right? So again here, since distance is always positive, absolute value is always a positive number. I can't have a negative distance, okay? If I am at a value of two or negative two away from zero, okay, I am still two units away from zero, right? So absolute value is the distance away. I'm two units away. It doesn't matter if it's in the positive direction or in the negative direction. It's the amount away that I am. It's always a positive value. So the definition of absolute value is what we call a piecewise function. A piecewise function, which we'll go over later in chapter two, is a function that's defined in pieces, okay? The first piece is that A is positive if A is already a positive value, right? We take the opposite value of A if A is a negative value, right? So notice this is not Z plus or Z negative because A is any real number, right? If it's a positive real number, we just use that positive real number. If A is a negative real number, well, in order to make it positive, I have to take the opposite sign of that opposite ne uh, value in order to make it a uh, positive number. Okay, so that's our definition. We have to take the two cases. If it's positive, we keep it positive. If it's in the negative world, then we make it positive. Okay, so here are some properties of the absolute value. Okay, first is that the absolute value of the number is always larger than zero or equal to zero. Okay, and again, that's because it's always positive. The only way it's equal to zero is if that value we're looking at is zero, right? Zero is a distance of zero from itself. Okay. A is the same as the absolute value of negative A. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's positive on the inside or negative on the inside, it's always going to be the same value because this uh, function here, this absolute value, only returns a positive number, right? A times B is the same thing as um, splitting it up and taking the absolute value of each factor and multiplying, right? So A times B, absolute value, is the same thing as taking the absolute value of A and the absolute value of B and multiplying them because this is positive and then this is a positive times a positive. So it's always going to be positive. Here, the absolute value of A over B is the same as taking the absolute value of the numerator and of the denominator and still doing the same operation, okay? Again, this is always positive. Here you have a positive over a positive, so you'll still get a positive value, okay? The absolute value of the sum of two numbers is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of their individual values okay so again think about this if this is 1 minus 3 that's going to be less than the absolute of value of 1 plus the absolute value of negative 3 right this would get you 2 this would be 4 right so this is called the triangle inequality we'll learn about that a lot more later on okay so now let's talk about distance 
the distance between two real numbers, A and B being real numbers. Okay, so again, the distance between two real numbers. So I need to have two real numbers, A and B being real numbers, is B minus A, absolute value, right? The notation for distance is D parentheses A comma B, right? So what that means is this is a function. It's a distance function. You're talking about going from A to B and the length you had to travel, the distance you had to travel to get there. And the way we calculate that is by taking where we end up, subtracting where we started, and then taking that absolute value, right? Because if this is positive, distance has to be negative, right? So that would be a positive distance, right? So we start at A, we end at B. This distance is B minus A, right? Because that's generally going to be a positive value anyways, because larger number minus a smaller number, okay? Now, if it just happened to be that this was reversed for some reason, um, this absolute value keeps this distance as a positive value, okay? Now, big question now, okay? Fractions or decimals? So this is now getting into my particular um, preference for mathematics, and this is true from Algebra 1 all the way through any course you'll ever take with me. There are times when fractions are important, and there are times when decimals are important, okay? More so, not even fractions, just exact values, okay? So what we're really going to talk about here is round off error, okay? In this course, we will use exact values, always. It doesn't matter how messy it looks, okay? I always want exact values. Exact values tend to be fractions. They tend to be some sort of algebraic expression. Um, the only time that I want decimals in this class is if I tell you I want decimals or if you are doing an application problem, okay? If you're doing an application problem, a decimal form of a number makes way more sense than the fraction form of a number, okay? So exact values are generally going to be our fractions. We use that in this class whenever possible, okay? For my students now, if you're a student of mine, you're watching this because of it's a requirement in my course, I will take off points if you are using decimal forms, okay? And when I say points, I don't mean points, I mean a point. I will take off a point if you are not using an exact form when I say I need an exact form, okay? So if you're gonna just use decimals everywhere, you're gonna you're gonna start getting points marked off, right? Approximate values are decimals, okay? Whenever we already have decimals in our problem, that's when you should just continue to use decimals, okay? Or if we're solving a word problem or an application problem, a decimal answer always makes more sense than a fractional answer. So for instance, 1.5 feet makes sense. It's one and a half feet. Yeah. Three over two feet as an answer is terrible, right? If you gave me an answer is like 13 over two feet, if this was for an employer, they'd be like 13 over two, like what the hell is that, right? You would say, oh, six and a half feet. I'm sorry, right? So decimals make sense when you already have decimals that you're working with or you're working with a word problem where your answer now has some sort of units attached, right? Feet squared, meters per second, um, inches, right? When you have some sort of an application, you should be using decimals for your final answer. Even then, you don't put things into, de into decimal form until the very, very end if you can, okay? Using decimal forms of numbers generally means that we need to round somewhere, okay? Because generally, um, generally there's some rounding going on if we're in decimal forms, okay? And since the entire decimal representation can be either tedious to use or it's impossible, this creates round off error, right? So for instance, when we talk about one third, if you start to do math on 0 0.333333, you're not going to write out threes forever because you can't. You have to stop somewhere. And as soon as you stop, right, some people stop after one decimal place and just write 0 0.3. Some people will write two. Some people will write five. It doesn't matter because 
at some point you're cutting off information and you're missing information at the point, right? If you only write 0 0.3, you went from one third to now three over 10, which is not the same as one third, right? You've actually changed your value, okay? If you write 0 0.33, you no longer have one third, you have 33 over 100. That's not the same. It's a little more accurate than three over 10, but you've cut off some information, there, okay? So whenever you round or cut off some information from a decimal form, you have some sort of error that is attached to that number. And that error compiles as you do more math and then you no longer have a correct answer. Okay, I see, I mark off students all the time because they cut off their decimal somewhere, they didn't use exact values, and their numbers are off by a couple of values or they're really, really off because that uh, the math compiled the error that was attached, right? So let's do an example that really, really shows why this is important, okay? Let's say we have x squared over 1 ninth over x minus 1 over 3, okay? Let's say that our x is 0 0.334, and let's use the four-digit approximations for the fractions. So instead of using 1 over 9, let's plug that in our calculator and cut it off at four digits. And instead of one over three, same thing, let's plug in our calculator and use the first four digits. Okay, so either, um, in this case, we didn't have to actually round, we had to round down, so we don't have to worry about the rounding error, but we do have to worry about what's called truncation error where we would cut off some values, right? So if we plug this in, I get 0 0.334, which is my x, I square it. Instead of one over nine, I have 0 0.111. Right. Instead of x, again, I have my 0 0.334, and instead of one third, I'm using 0 0.333. Right. If I plug this into my calculator, do it by hand, however I want to do it, I will get out the value one. Okay. Now let's say that we don't use these truncations. Right. Meaning, let's not use the four-digit approximations. Let's actually use one over ninth, and let's actually use one over three. Right, so the exact values, so not the approximations, the decimals, the exact values. So here I have 0 0.334 squared minus 1 ninth, 0 0.334 minus 1 third. Okay, so here I'm keeping them as fractions when I do the math. I will get out 0 0.667, right, or 2 thirds. Okay, this is a huge difference. Okay. If this was a grade, this would be 100%. This would be 66.67%. This is 100% an A. This is a D. Okay, That's an error of 33%. That is a big difference. Now, let's say that this was just a smaller part of a bigger calculation. So if I use the rounding error and I got one and then I then start doing more math with this result that I get all of my answers after that are way off okay so imagine if I were to do this when calculating your grades right you would go from an A to a D all because I didn't use exact values okay okay so long story short use exact exact values in this class whenever you can um, and if you do need to round your decimals, don't do any rounding into the very, 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 very last step, okay? Um, so that's it for our first section. Um, I hope this was informative in some sense. I know it can be kind of dry going over a review like this, but hopefully there is some new stuff in here um, that you haven't seen before or ways that you've thought of numbers that you haven't seen either. So uh, good luck. I'll see you on the next section.